Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're talking about House of the Dragon, episode 9, the episode before the finale. And I guess it is true, like, the Game of Thrones is as deadly as it is kinky. Viserys is dead and Sir Christian looks the same. And the ending with Renice, I mean, the whole time I thought either she was going to be knocked off her horse or she was going to kill these people. But the more I thought about it, it actually made a lot of sense because Renice, in the back of her mind really believes that Rhaenyra killed her son. So she's not all the way comfortable with like bending the knee to Rhaenyra. But at the same time, like we all, I think in that moment, we all collectively found out whose side we were not on. And that side is Aegon. So Viserys is finally dead. And it's to the point where his death actually comes as a shock because he's been alive for so long that we kind of just got used to it. Like they've been teasing his death for some time that we just kind of stopped caring. And turns out like he, people have been on standby for his death, ready to go. And I'm not sure how y'all feel about like Allison's storyline. Like she's almost getting to a point where she's too naive for her own good. Like the math ain't mathin. And there were a few indications of this, right? So first she informs the council that Viserys is dead and his dying wish was to have Aegon be king. And the council immediately was like, say less, you know, good looking out, but we were gonna make him king anyways. Second, I guess she's down bad because her and Laris have agreed to some sort of foot arrangement, some sort of weird foot fetish thing going on. And that whole scene, like, I totally lost the plot. Like, I was just like, what is happening here? Why is she taking off her socks? What is, and then she was looking away. And I don't know what Lara said to her in terms of blackmail, but in my head, I'm like, Allison, you're still the queen. And so what I understood is like, I guess Laris is in a position where he's able to come and go as he pleases, right? Like he was in the room, the transition was super awkward, but I guess all of it is to indicate that Allison pretty much is very naive and she doesn't have as much power as she wants to believe that she has, right? Like short of her father, she would not be anywhere right now. Now, hopefully that changes after this episode, like she starts playing the game for herself. But it's getting to a point where you're like, this is a lot, okay? Going back to this treacherous meeting, Allison informs the council that Viserys is dead and he wanted Aegon to be king. And the face acting in this episode, like everybody was looking left, right, and center. This old man gets up. As soon as he got up, I knew he was gonna die. And he was just like, sis, Viserys made it very clear until his dying death that he wants Rhaenyra to succeed him. Like, make it make sense, right? And Sir Christian just knocks him down. And Sir Christian is kind of unhinged. I feel like there's something not right with him. And that whole meeting was very tense. Like, I thought they were going to kill the Lord Commander at some point. Like, you just didn't know what was going to happen. Like, there was this vibe of uncertainty. People couldn't hide their disgust for what was happening. Allison, again, they've given her, like, the illusion of power. Like, they've allowed her to sit and speak on behalf of the king. But, it, like, she has no power. And you could see her trying to restore order, right? Especially when the conversation about killing Rhaenyra and her family came up. And again, there's a level of naivete here that doesn't really make any sense because for Aegon to be king, like Rhaenyra's gotta go. And she was really defending Rhaenyra. She's like, listen, the last thing Viserys wanted was his daughter dead. And Otto was like, and I care because, like this is not about honor. This is about survival. And even the way she reacted, like you could tell she was still trying to like restore order. And even when asked by the Lannister, like what would you suggest? She didn't have anything to say because I think she was hoping Viserys would live so she doesn't have to make decisions because she doesn't know what to do. And this meeting made that like very clear. And so at this point in time, Otto has all the power. I feel like Otto was temporary king. And the vibe here is either you bend the knee or you die. It's really that simple. And things are moving and everything begins and ends with Aegon, right? So at this point, they need to restore order. And the only way to do that is to control the future king. And I was surprised they didn't give Aegon the option of leaving, just like Laenor was allowed to leave. But they want Aegon to be king and not Aemon because Aegon is, is a puppet. You know, as long as he feels loved, 
he can be controlled. Whereas someone like Eamon, Eamon, okay, I didn't cover the last episode, but Eamon is, is vibes. Like Eamon, he's giving the energy, like this is men's business. Like I'm gonna make a decision of my own. And so Aegon is kind of perfect because he's the perfect puppet, right? He's young, he's impulsive, he, he's very predictable. And he's just like, he's, he's not that intelligent. Like it's easy to control him. So sadly for everyone, he's missing. And so the episode starts off and they need to find him so they can control him. And I loved Aegon's character arc because by the end of the episode, we're perfectly okay with him dying. You know, like I loved watching him start the episode like loveless, you know, just running away from all his responsibility to kind of basking in the love. And again, he, he's, he's very, he's like dying for love, right? Like he, he, he feels so unwanted. So I think the power will definitely get to his head. And I don't think he'll be as easily controlled as his mother thinks he is. But yeah, like, I, I don't know how y'all felt about Aegon, but he just... By the end of it, I was like, this man needs to go. So this whole search for Aegon was really interesting because you have two camps, right? And as they're looking for Aegon, you kind of realize that this man is not fit to be king at all. And he wasn't even much of a brother. So in one camp is Aemon and Sir Christian, and Aemon is kind of annoyed. Like, he's doing his duty, but he's like, listen, you best believe that like, if, I, if they told me I was gonna be king, I would be found. You know, why are we even looking for my raggedy brother? Not to mention the fact that he was a terrible brother, taking, his, taking Aemon to these like houses to lose his, like that whole scene when he recognized one of the women at the brothel, that was so awkward. You know, so they're knocking on all these doors and Otto has a team. And the whole time you're saying that, you know, Aegon really doesn't care. You know, he has, illegitimate children left and right apparently his fetishes run deep i mean this is a man that is hiding in plain sight right like he is not even trying to hide his depravity and unfortunately for Amon and sir christian it's otto who finds him first and they find him through the white worm and this this woman i don't know what her character arc will be but she hasn't aged a bit and this whole conversation that she has with Otto was, was really interesting because you could tell that Otto was really pissed that he even had to talk to her, right? Like, I'm 90% sure Otto burned down that house, but I'm not, I don't know what happened. That's a whole other conversation. People who read the books, let me know. But she was giving like immortal energy. And she said, listen, just remember, like I will tell you where Aegon is, but you, you better remember that it was us who told you where, you, like, you better remember that it's the people that give you power. And Otto looked kind of angry, right? Like, Otto is the type of person where, I don't think he thinks about the people. You no, know, as far as he's concerned, like, they are just props. And so I think even having to talk to her really made him angry. And at the end, he says, don't worry, I will remember. So that's why I think he burned down the place. Like, he didn't really appreciate being talked to any kind of way, but that's a whole other conversation. And so they finally find Aegon and he's totally useless, right? He's coughing up a storm. He's under a table. He, he is running around like he and the actor that they recast as Aegon is not very likable at all. Like I, I felt the first Aegon was more likable. Like he kind of got he got more ugly. I don't know how to describe him, at least before he was giving kingly vibes. Now he's just giving like frat boy energy, like everything about Aegon is frat boy. Stanford swimmer like I don't know he's just giving you know everything wrong with the world and so he begs Eamon he's like listen please like let me go you know like I don't want it you take it like let me leave and again a Aegon is over he never wanted it he's not fit he's insecure he doesn't like he, he's just kind of over it but uh, you know I felt bad for Eamon because again Eamon I don't know how y'all feel about Eamon but Eamon is fine like he's just vibes like he's everything about him just him sitting still like the actor who plays Eamon is like I don't even know like theater actor he's just giving 10 out of 10. So they drag Aegon's raggedy behind back they clean him up and they get him ready for the ceremony and the whole time he's in the car he just looks wasted he looks hungover they kind of clothe him but it, it, he's not a king and his mother is just looking at him like can you at least pretend to be grateful and I think with Aegon, the reason he spends so much time on the streets is because he has this inferiority complex. He knows he's not as smart as his brother. He knows his family pretty much hates him. 
He doesn't really care about his, like he, he just doesn't care at all. His mother is talking and she's trying to convince him like, no, I swear, like, you know, because she needs to convince Aegon that he's fit to rule so that she can control him. And the only way to do that is to convince him that his father really did make this decision. And Aegon, like, he, maybe he's a drug, but he's not a dummy, right? He's like, listen, Viserys made one thing clear. He didn't, he wanted Rhaenyra on the throne. And I, what, what really surprised me about Aegon is the way he took it. So he took it personally. I, he, he, he felt that the fact that his father didn't want him to succeed him meant that he hated him, which is a weird way to take it. You know, like he felt like it's because I'm not good enough when in fact that was never the reason. But Aegon's sort of inferiority complex now, it kind of makes more sense as the episode goes on. And so whatever the case, you know, he's off he's he's off to be king and it starts with the ceremony and the, the ceremony was really well done right this whole like forcing the poor people to watch like it was really interesting seeing the contrast of poor people in rags to these rich people with their golden knives and like you know what i mean like it, it was just like some homeless stuff like i, I was like the only one who's like this is so wrong on so many different levels. Like, are these people supposed to care? Like, they can't even eat. That's a whole other conversation. So there's a lot going on in the streets. There's children fighting. They're, like, it, it's, it's like really bad out there. But it doesn't really matter because Aegon's about to be king. Watching Aegon, like, kind of force himself to then loving it, right? Like, I love the sword work as he's coming in. Like, he, first, he's not that excited about it. Then he gets there on stage. And I think what surprised him is the fact that everyone accepted him as king because as we found out in the previous episodes, no one really wanted Rhaenyra to succeed. Like they, everybody felt Aegon was like the rightful successor to the throne. But I don't think Aegon understood that. And so watching his whole family like kind of bend the knee to him, right? Like they were like, ugh, like is this, they have no respect for him, but surprisingly the people did. And, you could see he was like getting off on the power and the love like he started like raising his sword like he was king arthur like, he he was in love they they have this habit of biting off more than they can chew and this point was made very clear towards the end of the episode so throughout this episode they kind of rounded up the usual suspects and they made it clear to to all the other houses if you don't bend the knee you're not coming out of here alive right like that like point blank, point blank and period and one of the people that they were trying to change is renice and I love that whole like sequence of events when, you know, Renice was locked in the house and these people were rounded up, like they had no idea what was coming. So Otto moved fast, like I will give him credit for that. So Renice, there's a conversation between Renice and Alicent at some point where Alicent is trying to get Renice on her side, right? And, and, and the whole time Alicent is talking, Renice is like, listen, I know you say you care about your son, but you need to care about yourself. You know, like you need to play the Game of Thrones for yourself because these men over here that you're fighting for and trying to defend, they would never do the same for you. And that conversation was really important because first, Renice has some sort of respect for Allison, and second, she kind of sees a window of opportunity, right? Like she, she didn't really know what to make of Allison. And again, in the back of Renice's mind, Rhaenyra killed her son. So the lead up to the end was really fantastic because pretty much like, it's a house divided and the soldiers that were kind of entrusted of bringing back Aegon decided you know what Aegon is raggedy and one of the twins takes Renice out but sadly Renice got lost in the sauce and she's watching Aegon's procession right so the whole time she's watching Aegon become king she's just like man I wanna like I don't know how she felt I don't think she felt angry I don't think she felt happy but she knew she had to get out of there and the only way out of there is this dragon and hosting it hosting the ceremony in the dragon pit was a huge mistake again it's like biting off more than you can chew because first of all like your defenses are down and again it's arrogance right like we can't be stopped and Renice proved proved them wrong right she grabs the dragon and that whole scene that ending was so fantastic i really thought i really wanted these people to die like that's how i knew in that moment that was team Rhaenyra. even though like uh, when you think about their blood and the things they've been doing, they're not that great either. And that's how the episode ends, right? She, she flies off. She looks Allison dead in the eye. Even Allison thought she was going to die. And I think that was the point, right? To scare her a bit and let her know, like, listen, you're alive because of me. You know, 
remember that. And that's how the episode ends. So I think the finale will be great. I'll do my best to try and release the, the review shortly after the episode comes out, like same day or within a couple hours. But um, it, it, it was a great episode. So you guys let me know what you think and until next time.